Hey everyone, glad you are joining us either online or in person this weekend. I'm Vicki Curzonay, I'm one of the pastors here, and I wanna share with you a few things that are going on at VCDC this month. We encourage you to continue joining us online for our Wednesday devotional at 4.30 p.m. and our worship night on Friday at 7.30 p.m. I'm excited to announce our next online equipped class will be Hearing God's Voice. It will be held Tuesday, July 28th from 7 to 8 p.m. If you have not taken this class, we encourage everyone to join Heather Kamira, who will, who will be leading this class over Zoom. You will need to register in advance by sending an email to info at vcdc.org. Our next No Contact Food Pantry and Medical Clinic will be held Monday, July 20th. Also, if you are in need of support, we are here to help you in any way that we can. You may reach out to us either by calling the church office or sending an email to info at vcdc.org. Finally, we have always highlighted the importance of small groups. What a blessing it has been to our church body during this time. So we encourage you to continue pressing into your small group community. And if you are not already involved in one, we encourage you to consider visiting a few. Understand, however, that some are meeting in person, some are online and will remain that way for some time, and some are offering a hybrid. So whether you pick up a card in the lobby this weekend or you go to our website at vcdc.org, be sure to contact the leader in advance to confirm when and how they are gathering. Well, that's all we have for announcements. I hope you have a great weekend. Whew, head check, hello. Am I on? Yep. Hey, <clears throat> thank you, Andrew. Um, again, I echo what Andrew said. It's great to see everyone. It's great just to be in the same room together. And, and I want to say to you, well, let me, oh, I already blew it. Good evening to those of you in the room and good evening to those of you viewing uh, online. <laughs> trying to slim down. But really, for those that are going to be watching us tomorrow, we're glad you're joining us too. Okay, there we go. But um, I know this is, it feels different, doesn't it? I mean, it feels great, but it feels different. Maybe you feel a little bit off balance, but I tell you, it is so awesome to be, uh, to be together. You've done a great job uh, just flowing with uh, the, uh, all the changes, etc. So well done to all of you. I thought it would be fun to start off uh, with some COVID-19 humor. Um, so what's the difference between COVID-19 and Romeo and Juliet? One's the coronavirus and the other is a Verona crisis. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hey, I ran out of toilet paper and had to start using old newspapers. Boy, oh boy, the times are rough. <clears throat> okay, there's only, we can only go up. Um, the grocery stores in France look like tornadoes hit them. All that's left is debris. This is not going how I thought. I'll tell, you a corona, I'll tell you a coronavirus joke now, but you'll have to wait two weeks to see if you got it. Okay, okay, there we go. Wait, this, one's, this is my best one. Did you hear that Finland, Finland has closed its borders? Do you know what that means? That means that no one will be crossing the finish line. Kadoosh. Thank you for the groans. They are really like fuel in my tank. What, what do you tell yourself when you wake up late for work and realize you have a fever? You say, self, I so late. Okay, okay, I might need to get uh, some security to get me out of the building. Did you, last one, did you hear the joke about the germ? Never mind, I don't want to spread it around. Okay, uh, it's good to laugh. It's good to groan, isn't it? Uh, seriously, it has been such a crazy year and we're only halfway through. As I was thinking about this reopening weekend and uh, just preparing for it, I kept thinking about the first sermon I gave the first weekend of January of this year. And this li this is a, these are like right from my notes. Here's what I said in the intro for, for the beginning of this year. This year is significant, 2020 perfect vision. We're going to be hearing that a lot. New year, new decade. It's an election year, so we have lots of heartwarming ads and social media posts to look forward to. Happy face. You know, when I read that, I thought, wow, little did we know what 
was coming our way this year. And, and I vividly remember the day when we decided to cancel our weekend services. You know, uh, the news is, all this news is coming in and we're listening to that, Governor DeWine, all this stuff is coming our way. And, and it was like a sense of like, is, is this the end of the world? Is the world coming to an end? Uh, I, I remember that on that day, I left the building and I went and I sat in my car and uh, out in the parking lot and I took a big breath and I sat there and I felt this wave of fear and anxiety just boom, just crash on me. And I sat there in the parking lot and I thought, Lord, what's going to happen to VCDC? Like, like our, our, you know, will, will, will people just drift away from the church family? Will this online church thing actually work? Uh, when we do reopen, and who knows when we we're going to reopen, will anyone come back? Um, I sat in my car thinking all those thoughts, thinking those questions, and I did what we've always taught us to do in times of anxiety. I made an exchange. And I just said, Lord, I give that to you. And I prayed this little prayer. I said, Jesus, Jesus, only you can hold our church together. What am I gonna do? What are we gonna do as a staff? Jesus, only you can hold us together. And here we are four months plus later, and I'm thankful and I'm confident that uh, Jesus has answered and will continue to answer that prayer to hold us together. Because again, we don't know where this is going. You look around the news and again, it's so, it's so confusing, but we see numbers spiking all around the country, all around the world. And it's, it's, it's such strange times that we live in. So before I get to my talk, first thing I want to do is I want to thank you you, uh, VCDC, for your patience and your perseverance during this, uh, during this crazy time. I know it's not been easy. I know that some of you have had a sense of loneliness. You've had a sense of just feeling isolated, disconnected. You've had a sense of um, uh, just a homesickness for the, our church family and for our weekend gathering. So uh, again, thanks for your, your patience. And so here's what I want to talk about tonight as we reopen, and really this talk is a challenge. It's a challenge for me, it's a challenge for you. Um, you may not have noticed, but we just celebrated 4th of July. Did you notice that? Uh, American independence. And, and this year was special uh, to me. This was our 20th year living in the United States. I was saying that to Helen, like where, obviously we haven't, well, thank you, Don. I'm not sure what that means, but thank you. Obviously, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's 20 years of celebrating the 4th of July, and although it's our 20th time, this year was the first time that I couldn't stop, as we celebrate, I couldn't stop thinking about the name of this great nation, the United States of America. And a certain word really grabbed me, the United States of America. And that word united means this, it means made into or caused caused to act as a single entity. And the strength of this nation is rooted in its unity. It's rooted in a whole bunch of people gathering together and embracing a vision that's way bigger than, than themselves. Now that said, and, and why I think the word unity stood out to me was because I don't know if I've ever, uh, I, I don't remember a time when we've had so little unity. I'm not sure I remember a time where there's been so much division. You've got election year plus COVID-19 plus racial, racial unrest, racial tension equals incredible division. And one of the things that I see is, um, you know, uh, so much polarization where all these different issues are moving us further and further away from each other. You know, dividing lines like Republican, and if I'm pointing your direction, you know, you just take it out however you want. But Republican, Democrat, uh, uh, COVID is real. COVID's a scam. CNN, Fox News, we should wear masks. I'm not going to wear a mask. Uh, defund the police, empower the police. Black lives matter. All lives matter. And, and more importantly, pizza with pineapple, pizza without pineapple. <laughs> I saved that one for last because I could see the room polarizing. So, but so much division, but hear me, hear me. That list, that's just what I've heard and observed in our church family. 
right? And to think that we still have five months till the election. And when I think of us as a church family, just like the United States, our strength is rooted in our unity. Uh, uh, You know, it's us embracing, all these different people embracing a vision that's bigger than ourselves. Division is messy. Division, uh, Division does damage to relationships. And more importantly, most importantly, as Christians, as followers of Jesus, division gets in the way of us being the people of God. It gets in the way of us doing the work that he's given us to do. So here's my challenge. And this challenge is, is just as much for me as it is for you. Um, uh, for many of us, it's time for a game plan adjustment. Well, what do I mean by that? Here's what I mean. Think Buckeyes. Okay, now I, I know you're listening. Think football. Uh, you know, I think of the last season for the Buckeyes. What did we see over and over and over, right? The Buckeyes would get on the field first quarter. They just wouldn't seem to be doing very well. Right? And, and it's like they're trying to figure out, they're trying to, uh, uh, trying to figure the opponent out. And they might struggle in the first quarter, they might even struggle in the second quarter. But here's what we, we all knew. Even if they went, you know, halftime, even if they went into the locker room down on the scoreboard, we were still confident. Because we knew they were going to do what? They were going to do a game plan adjustment during halftime. And then third quarter, they would come out and they would whoop, you know, pretty much anyone that they were playing. We're halfway through 2020. There's so much division in this country. Have we not figured out the opponent's game plan? Like, do you not see what the opponent's game plan is? It's division. And so it's time for an adjustment. And as Christians, as followers of Jesus, when we make a game plan adjustment, it's always an adjustment of the heart. It's the attitude of the heart. And it's always an adjustment, it's movement towards God, and it's movement towards others. It's always an adjustment towards love, towards kindness, towards patience. And many times, I think honestly, most times, in order for you and I to make that adjustment, it's going to require an adjustment, movement away from self and from our desires. The people of God, we are called to be and we are made. We were made to be united. And again, united means made into or caused to act as a single entity. Now think about that that definition. That should, uh, if you think about the church, right? Caused to act as a single entity. That should ring a bell about a, a picture that the Bible paints of what a church family acts like, and fu- acts like and functions like. What is the Bible? What's that picture? It's we are one body with many parts, right? That's a, that's a picture we see in the Bible. And, and the goal for us as a church family is not our personal fulfillment, but rather it's our corporate. It's our body fulfillment. So what is God's plan for us? What's, God, what's God's plan for us as a body? Ephesians 4.15 says this. It says, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is, Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. You know, when you look at that, the sign of a healthy Christian community, the sign of a growing Christian community, a maturing Christian community is unity. It's us moving towards each other. But notice that from those verses that it says, or that it's going to take work for us to grow as a church body. It's going to take work for us to mature and to move towards, uh, towards unity. And, and what is that work? What is that work? What's that, what's that each part that each one of us needs to do? It's the hard work of moving towards we instead of me. It's the hard work that totally goes against the grain of humanity to put more weight more value, more importance on what's best for us over what's best for me. And, and really what I'm talking about is this wonderful thing we see all throughout the Bible, and it's called self-denial, which is easy, right? 
Right, yeah, that was good sarcasm. Not at all, right? If you want to follow Jesus, think about this. If you want to follow Jesus, self-denial is at the very heart of that following. Mark 8, 34, Jesus says this. I mean, try to picture this. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples. He said, hey, gather around everybody, right? Gather around. He said this, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel, for the good news, for the kingdom way, will save it. Now, now many of us have heard that verse like lots of times. And I want to challenge you, like, think about what Jesus is saying. If I, you know, if I was Jesus, if I, if I was like his, uh, you know, his manager and we're trying to do sales, I'd say, hey, Jesus, come here for a sec. Like, you're not going to get a lot of sales with a pitch like that, right? And there's not going to be a lot of takers. Who would say yes to that? Who would say yes to, you know, Jesus standing up in front of all these people. He said, hey, you've been watching me. I'm the miracle man. And you're wondering, is he the Messiah? Could he really be the one? And you're like, you so want to follow me. But let me tell you what it's going to take to follow me. You're going to have to deny yourself in order to follow me. But think about it. Isn't that what we've said yes to? Your kingdom come, not mine. Your will be done, not mine. It's not just hard work. When I look at self-denial... I was going to say, I don't know about you, but I totally know about you because I know about me. It's not just hard work. It's impossible work for us to do that on our own. It literally, it literally needs God to take up residence in my heart and in your heart and to change us from the inside out to, to be able to do something like that. And that's why we pray in the vineyard over and over and over. Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. We we can't do this. What you're asking us to do to deny ourselves, it's impossible for us. Come, Holy Spirit, you have to change me from the inside out if, you, if, if, if I'm going to do that. Galatians 5.19 says this. It says, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, FM radio, and other sins. I I got to check in with you every once in a while. And other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God won't experience, anyone choosing that life won't experience this, in the incredible life that God offers to each one of us, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That is what God wants to grow in your life and in, and in my life. And I need to get out of the way. I need to get my hands out of the garden for him to take over the, you know, the garden of my heart to grow his fruit. And, and so why is that important? Why is self-denial important? Why is our unity important? Well, uh, I would say this. Because as Christians, followers of Jesus, if we really are one body, like I'm looking at all of you, right? If we really are one body, and if we really are his body, well, then wouldn't it make sense that, that the, the more united we are as a body, the healthier we are? <sighs> wouldn't it make sense then that the more united we are, the clearer we will reflect Jesus to, to the world? John 13, 34, Jesus said, a new command I give you. Hey, you want to follow me? You want to follow me? Here's a command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you, which is pretty amazing love. We sang about it tonight. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if, if you love one another. So what is it? What is it that demonstrates to the world that we are followers of Jesus? Our love the way we treat each other, our love for one another. And, and can, can you see why? 
Can you see why division is the game plan of the enemy? Can you see how division gets in the way? I mean, imagine if my body just split right now. Besides being really gruesome, but this is a waterproof flooring that we've put in, so it would be an easy wash up, but it would not be a pleasant image for you. But I would be useless. Can you see how division gets in the way of us being the body of Christ? Of us being the people of God, of us partnering with him and his work here on planet Earth. So how, how do we respond to this challenge? How do we respond to this challenge uh, for a game plan adjustment towards the ways of God? What, what will it take for us, to, uh, uh, for us to move from a focus on me to more of a focus on we? Uh, how do we do that work of maturing and growing into a unified body? Matthew 4.19, Jesus said this. <clears throat> he said, come follow me and I will send you out to fish for people. I'll send you out to do my work. At once they left their nets and followed him. Um, that's a simple little verse, verse 20. And in this story, Jesus is calling some of his first disciples and for them to follow Jesus, it meant what? It meant leaving their nets, right? And in the story, them leaving their nets, it literally meant that they left their careers to follow Jesus. Now, what I'm not saying tonight is that we should all quit our jobs and we're all going to move into the church. Uh, we're not going to do that. <laughs> it will be like Hunger Games. But, but what I felt the Lord said to me was this. When he invited you to follow him, right? When he invited us to follow him, we all had nets in our hands. And, you know, maybe tonight there's someone in the room or maybe there's someone watching online and, he, and Jesus is inviting you right now to follow him. And, and, and the truth is, either way, we all have nets in our hands when we come to Jesus, when Jesus calls us. Uh, what do I mean by nets? I mean, we all, we all have worldviews. We all have opinions. We all have beliefs. We all have biases. We all have dreams. We all have fears. And nets that are not necessarily good or bad, but they're filling up our hands. And because of those nets, we are not able to grab on now to take hold of what Jesus is, is wanting us to grab onto because our hands are full. So just like the disciples, for us to answer the call of Jesus with a yes, it means that we're gonna have to leave our nets. It means that we're gonna have to let go of our nets, all these things that we're holding so that now our hands are free. Now we can take hold of what Jesus is calling us to take hold of, his ways, his plans. And, and, you know, and you've probably discovered this if you've you know, been a Christian for more than a week, uh, that this letting go of self, this self-denial, this letting go of, you know, what I want for what he wants, um, it's not just a one-time thing you do, right? Like, like thanks, Jeff. <laughs> we, we have a tendency to pick those nets up again all the time. And so we have to, over and over and over, we have to keep making that step of letting go of our nets and taking hold of what Jesus has called us to. And I believe, church, that we're in a significant time and for us to be the people of God, for us to do what he has for us to do in this crazy, significant time that we're living in, it is going to take, it is going to take us uh, to make a game plan adjustment. It's gonna take a laying down of our nets we're going to have to let go in order to take hold of what he has for us. And, and, you know, personally, these last few weeks have been a few weeks of letting go of nets, of really a, a time of repentance for me, a time of making exchanges where as I sort of take what's in my heart, like, Lord, here's what's in my heart. Here, here are my attitudes. Here, here's my anger. Here are my judgments. Here are, you know, my desires to lash out at people. Here are my desires to invite some people to go play hockey, right? Ask me afterwards. That's a really good joke. But okay, here, here is all the stuff that's in my heart. Jesus, I'm giving it, it to you. And in return, would you give me what's in your heart? Make that exchange. Our strength as a church family it's, it's, it, we, we get stronger and stronger as each one of us makes that decision. When we let go of our nets 
and we, and we together, we grab on to a vision that's way bigger than us, to his vision, to a kingdom vision, to the ways and works of Jesus. And, and like, I am convinced that we have an incredible opportunity to shine light into a very divided darkness in our country. Chuck Colson said, the darker it gets, the brighter the light shines. Such a simple truth, but such a profound truth. I remember, and I'll end with this story. Uh, I remember when I was a teenager back in the 80s, in the 1980s, uh, I remember hearing a story about the uh, bubonic plague. It was also called the Black Death. Um, way back in the 1340s, 1350s, there was a plague, and it was estimated that it literally wiped out a third of the planet. And in those days, that was, again, these are estimated amounts. That was like 20 million people. And this plague sent like a shock wave of fear, you know, all around the planet. And, and that, that wave went through cities and countries, and it created this powerful current. And it was like an attitude of, hey, every man, every, everybody, everyone for themselves. And literally, during the plague, parents, I mean, imagine this, parents would just abandon their children and they'd run out of the cities and just leave their kids to fend for themselves. Fathers would abandon families, mothers would abandon families, friends, families, all over. People would be fleeing the cities to get away from the plague. But, but in this story, uh, history also told the story of another group of people who turned against the current of the day. Christians, people just like you, People just like me, they turned against the current of the day and while other people are running out of town, run for your life, they ran into the cities and they cared for the dying and they cared for those and, and took care of the ones who had died. And I remember as a teenager hearing that story and it just hit something inside and I thought, oh, do you think I could be a Christian like that? Do you think I could live my life on planet Earth with such a kingdom abandonment that I'd be so full of the Spirit of God and so in love with the ways of God that I wouldn't even fear for my own life and that I would be willing to turn against the current of the age and to go the opposite of where everyone else was running and willing to lay down my rights in order to be Jesus to another person, in order to serve another person. And, and I am convinced that we're in a similar time to, the, to that time in history. Now, I'm not saying a third of the population is going to die. What I'm saying is there is a plague of division that's, that's roaring around our planet. And there is a strong current that many people, many of us are caught up in, and it's a current of me. It's a current of my ways and what I want. And I believe that you and I, as followers of Jesus, I am convinced we were made for a time like this. For such a time. And you know how I know that? You know, you know how I know you were made for this time? Do you have a pulse? <laughs> you were made for this time. We were made, as followers of Jesus, we have an incredible opportunity to turn into that current that's in our communities, our neighborhoods, our families. We're, I mean, into that current and to shine light into divided darkness, to be a person of peace in a cultural storm. Uh, and here's the thing, it starts right here. It starts right here in our hearts where we just say, come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit, search me. Change me. Enable me to do what you're asking me to do. And it, and it flows from our hearts and then it flows into here, into our church family. It's where we put our energy into fighting for each other, not against each other. It's where we learn to love each other at a really hard, stressful, stretching time. And then it spreads from our hearts to here and it spreads beyond these walls. And we now get to go out into our neighborhoods, places of work, wherever you go. And we get to be people of peace. We literally get to be light bearers, going into dark places, spreading hope, spreading peace, spreading love.